How's it going guys? General lung conditions presentation for USMLA. Decided to haphazardly throw random conditions together. Don't really know what to tell you. Okay. Some allergic conditions, obstructive sleep apnea, pulmonary fibrosis. All right, let's just hop through. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, AKA usual interstitial pneumonitis, weird sounding name for it, but you got to know UIP shows up on uh, the new NBMEs twice, okay? So you'll get a vignette of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You're looking for it as an answer. You're like, where the fuck is it? Not there, but UIP is listed. Four out of five times, going to be a patient over the age of 50 who's got a six to 12 month history of idiopathic dry cough. So it's a high yield differential. And you're going to have an increased or no change for V1 over FVC because it's a restrictive lung disease. I've made other pres presentations talking about how this is due to radial traction, which is stickiness on the outside of the airways that holds the airways open longer than an obstructive lung disease where you don't have radial traction. So the FEV1 is lower in obstructive lung disease. If that sounds confusing, go to my other PowerPoints where I talk about this stuff, shunt bed space, AA gradient, uh, obstructive versus restrictive. Now, very, very buzzy that you know reticular and reticulonodular mean fibrosis on USMLE. This is known as honeycombing colloquially. USMLE is not going to use the latter in stems, but reticular and reticulonodular show up everywhere in NBME exams for fibrosis. And you're going to do a chest x-ray followed by CT for diagnosis and then ultimately biopsy to confirm. Not too dramatic, but I'm just letting you know that uh, the 2CK form, they do assess that sequence for diagnosis. And then very high yield stuff, which I discussed in my cardio presentations, but you need to know that a loud P2 means pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so they can give you that. Also tricuspid regurge, okay, holostolic murmur that increases with inspiration, not pulmonic regurge, tricuspid regurge and loud P2 both mean pulmonary hypertension. So you can see either of those findings in a patient who has, for instance, dry inspiratory crackles heard bilaterally, that's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis causing pulmonary hypertension leading to a loud P2 where the valve slams shut due to increase uh, distal pressure or tricuspid regurgitation. Now, we said four out of five times going to be a patient over the age of 50 who has six to 12 month history of idiopathic dry cough. One out of five times, they can just give you a one month history of cough and they'll give you an, a more extended history of shortness of breath, sometimes on exertion. And you're like, well, that kind of sounds like left heart failure. But then they give you other findings such as chest X-ray shows interstitial markings, chest X-ray shows a reticular, reticulonodular pattern, or that there's an increased FE1 over FEC showing restrictive pattern, okay? That can actually be annoying the latter part because in theory, uh, uh, pulmonary edema from left heart failure actually is restrictive, but I'm just saying that uh, for pulmonary fibrosis, this is what they'll do. Perfenidone, weird sounding drug you have to be aware of. You have, that can be used for pulmonary fibrosis. You assimilate assesses it. Okay, so they're not going to assess the mechanism, which is that it's an antifibrotic agent that inhibits TGF beta mediated synthesis collagen. I write that here for you, but they'll just give you UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis, standard vignette. And then the answer is just perfenidone. You're like, what the fuck? Not hard if you heard of it. COPD. Okay, so COPD equals chronic bronchitis plus emphysema. Obviously, it's a generic term, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that can refer to other lung conditions as well, such as asthma or cartagena, etc. But if you just hear COPD, it's interchangeable. It's just saying, well, you got a patient who has the combination of chronic bronchitis plus emphysema. Hyperinflated lungs are going to push the heart to the midline, causing what's referred to as a vertical heart or a long, narrow cardiac silhouette. They can tell you that the point of maximal impulse is palpated in the sub xiphoid space. So it's a high yield finding, you know, for COPD. Now, in contrast, this chest x-ray, which is not COPD, this is left ventricular hypertrophy, okay, dilated heart, can be dilated, can be hypertrophic, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But notice how the, there's an enlarged cardiac silhouette where the left ventricle is lateralized, okay? They can say point of maximal impulse in the anterior axillary line. Whereas if we go back to the COPD, chest x-ray, see that's a long, narrow cardiac silhouette, point of maximum impulse will be in the midline, the sub xiphoid space. Okay, the hyperinflated lungs pushing the heart to the midline. They are chronic CO2 retainers. Okay, so your CO2 is going to be increased. 
and your bicarb's going to go up because we have a chronic respiratory acidosis. If you hold your breath right now for two minutes and you induce an acute respiratory acidosis, your bicarb is not going to change. So the fact that we have high, high CO2 with high bicarb is what denotes that we have a chronic respiratory acidosis. It's when the patient's bicarb has gone up. So the pH can be normal or it can be decreased based on the degree of compensation. Exacerbation of COPD is challenging where it can be precipitated oftentimes idiopathically or by viral infection where these patients who already have a high CO2 they're going to get a super fucking elevated CO2. So we call this acute respiratory acidosis with chronic respiratory acidosis. It's the same thing as writing acute on chronic, but I've seen NBME write this, okay? So when we say that these patients with COPD are chronic CO2 retainers, they're walking around with high CO2. Normal CO2 is 33 to 44 millimeters of mercury. So a patient with COPD could be walking around with a CO2 of, let's say, 50 and a bicarb, which is normal range 22 to 28, let's say their bicarb is 32. So they're walking around with a CO2 of 50 and a bicarb of 32. That's their chronic respiratory acidosis. And then in an exacerbation of COPD, what's going to happen is their CO2 might jump to 80. Holy shit. So they've got an acute respiratory acidosis on top of their baseline that we just discussed, and their CO2 can go lower. This is important that you just know of the concept of, okay, exacerbation of COPD, that's a high CO2. Because for 2CK especially, you might get a patient with COPD with a difficult vignette, and there might be a low-grade fever, and they'll say CO2 is low, and you're like, well, it's not fucking exacerbation of COPD, okay? Actually, it'd be kind of weird if you had a low CO2 in a COPD patient. The point I'm telling you is that if you get a vignette, period, it doesn't have to be a COPD patient. You just say, you get a vignette, and the CO2 is low, you can just instantaneously eliminate exacerbation of COPD as the answer, because clearly a patient with COPD would have a, a high fucking CO2. And I just said that can be precipitated by uh, viral infections, but they still want you to give antibiotics anyway. It's just part of the management for 2CK in step three, okay? So you say, even though this patient with an exacerbation of COPD, it's likely just idiopathic slash viral uh, as the precipitation, as the, precip as the impetus, you're still going to give antibiotics, okay? It's just something you got to know. Now, the first line for COPD is going to be an anti-muscarinic, okay? So muscarinic receptor antagonist or a beta-2 agonist. Guidelines will get technical and say, oh, well, tiotropium, more of a longer acting, or olodaterol, ultra long acting, okay, agents are first line. Doesn't fucking matter for US Simile. And I can tell you that questions show up on the real deal as per student feedback where they'll just list one agent. They might just list hypertropium, which is a short acting muscarinic receptor antagonist, and that's the answer, and they don't list any other drugs. Okay, so they're not going to list albuterol and olodaterol together, or tiotropium and olodaterol together. No, they're not going to do that. It's going to be one of these drugs. So be flexible. Just say it can be an anti-muscarinic, such as hypertropium and tiotropium, or it could be albuterol or olodaterol. Just look for, out for any of these drugs as a first line. And then plus or minus corticosteroid, inhaled corticosteroids, such as fluticasone, as the second drug we would add on. Now, home oxygen, this shows up in one of the 2CK forms where uh, you need to know that the threshold of giving home oxygen is less than 88% saturation or 55 millimeters mercury or 89% saturation, which is 60 millimeters mercury, if the patient is core pulmonale. Now, when I say it shows up in a 2CK form, there's a question with COPD where they give um, oxygen sats, uh, I think it was like low 90s, like they give the millimeters of mercury, it was in the 70s, and home oxygen was wrong. And the student's asking, like, well, why don't we give home oxygen here? And it's like, well, they give the millimeters, the PO2 in the 70s, and you got to know that the thresholds are lower, okay? So as we have written here, one fucking question I've seen on it, but you got to get a 280 on step two. That's the idea, right? So for 2CK, you should know that you're going to do lung cancer screening. If the patient meets all three of the following, must be 55 to 80 years old, must have a 20-plus pack of history of smoking, must have smoked in the past 15 years. You're going to do low-dose annual CT. Let's go to chronic bronchitis. So this is defined as productive cough for at least three months uh, for two consecutive years. And 
There's something called read index, which is just if you do a biopsy, you're going to see the mucus producing layer is greater than one half of the thickness of the bronchial wall itself. And colloquially, bronch chronic bronchitis is known as blue bloater because you get a shitload of hypoxic vasoconstriction. Okay, and this can just cause the patient to be blue. Don't really know what to tell you. All right. Now, the mechanism high yield for causing pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. If you have hypoxic vasoconstriction due to all of the mucus that's there, well, constriction of those vessels is going to lead to increased afterload on the right ventricle. So that's increased, that increased afterload, that's pulmonary hypertension, that can lead to core pulmonale. Okay, so that's an important mechanism that you're aware. JVD, peripheral edema. I get, I get more specific here that um, when we have right heart failure, so you just got to know that if you get a loud P2, on its own, that might reflect pulmonary hypertension, as we talked about before, but that doesn't necessarily mean the patient has overt right heart failure, okay, loud P2 or tricuspid regurge. What tells us we have core pulmonale is we actually have right heart decompensation, which is right ventricular hypertrophy, JVD, peripheral edema, any of those findings. As I just fucking talked about, loud P2, tricuspid regurge, high yield for pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonale. And then I just make a note about uh, acute bronchitis is completely unrelated to chronic bronchitis, okay? You might get a patient who does not have COPD, who gets a viral infection, and they just get a deep, dry cough in the lungs, and that could just be uh, acute bronchitis, acute viral bronchitis, okay? So don't confuse it with chronic bronchitis, which we just talked about is a uh, productive cough for at least three months uh, for two consecutive years, almost always in a smoker. Emphysema is loss of loss slash destruction of the alveolar surface area. You have capillaries for gas exchange within the surface area. So by uh, having obliterated alveolar surface area, we have obliterated capillary surface area. You don't get the uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction the same way that you do with chronic bronchitis. It's not that the patient is fucking like sitting there bright pink. It's just it just means to say that the patient is not going to be overtly blue if we had a pure emphysema scenario when we talk about textbook stuff. Okay. As I already talked about. So you're you're losing the capillaries within the alveolar because you're losing the alveolar surface area. And this is the mechanism for pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale due to emphysema where you can think back to physics from high school and college, where in a parallel circuit, you have resistance equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3, et cetera. So if you knock out transistors in your parallel circuit, you're gonna increase resistance. So by knocking out the capillary beds, you're increasing resistance, that backs up to the right heart, okay? So for chronic bronchitis, we had epoxy vasoconstriction causing constriction of the pulmonary vessels, increase after in the right heart. For emphysema, we're literally losing the capillaries, losing transistors in our parallel circuit, increasing resistance on the right heart. Bolus changes, just something very buzzy you got to know, means emphysema and USMLA. And smokers you can get what's called centrias in our emphysema, whereas uh, alpha 1 trypsin deficiency is known as panas in our emphysema, where the entire alveolus is destroyed. alpha 1 trypsin, it's co dominant. A condition, the double Z allele apparently is the worst. Uh, they asked that on the US simile. And alpha 1 trypsin is an enzyme that's produced in the liver. They want you to know that, the liver. It goes to the lungs, and despite its name, antitrypsin, it's, it normally breaks down elastase. Okay, so if you don't have alpha 1 trypsin because you have a deficiency, then you're going to have increased elastase, which is going to lead to emphysema. Okay. Now, where it can get annoying is that if we talk about very easy textbook uh, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency vignette, it might be a 28-year-old dude who's never smoked before who has bolus changes and emphysema. OMG. Okay, obviously that's just alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. But another thing they can do is they can say, for instance, a dude is 34, has been smoking for five years, his dad died from alcoholic cirrhosis, and he, but the 34-year-old has emphysema, and you're like, well, he's a smoker, though. Or his dad was a drinker, though. So the cirrhosis and the emphysema, well, there's known etiologies. How do you know it's alpha one trypsin? It's the fact that alpha one trypsin deficiency causes accelerated emphysema and cirrhosis. So you got to be careful, because they like to give you a patient who smoked a little bit, or a family member who drank a little bit. 
two beers a day, not a big deal. But you shouldn't get cirrhosis from two beers a day. You shouldn't get emphysema from smoking for, for, for five years. If they want to give you emphysema due to smoking, they'll say, dude's 50s, 60s, and he's been smoking a pack a day for 40 years, okay? Asthma, okay, bronchospasm, idiopathic, can be hereditary, certain antigens, okay, like pollen. And then you got to know that cough variant asthma. Uh, so a third of patients will only present with a dry cough, especially I yield for 2CK family med. They'll give you a 12-year-old who just has a dry cough, especially that's worse in cold air, never had any issues of shortness of breath. That's asthma. And then A to P is a high yield constellation, right? So dry cough in the winter, rhinoconjunctivitis, hay fever in the spring, eczema in the summer. That's your classic textbook constellation, okay? It doesn't have to present with that, but it can. One fucking NBME question uh, gave dry cough in the summer because they're assholes. But I mean, you're talking like 29 out of 30 times it's going to be in the winter. The point is just know that asthma doesn't have to be a patient as short as a breath. Just know that if you have a youngish patient who's got an unexplained dry cough, asthma. Okay, and then they, and they can also tell you that the chest X-ray shows mild hyperinflation or no changes for asthma. Okay, there's a question where they give a 34 year old woman, African American, uh, where you're thinking, OMG, it's sarcoidosis, but then they tell you chest X-ray shows no abnormalities. She had a dry cough. The answer was asthma. Okay, it's on one of the forms. You need to know leukotrienes, LT, CD, and E4 uh, cause bronchoconstriction, okay? LT, B4 is a neutrophilic chemotactic molecule. It's unrelated. But I just mentioned this because ultra high yield, you know that the lipoxygenase pathway. So you've got arachidonic acid that can get shunted down the cyclooxygenase pathway to make prostaglandins, prostacyclins, or it can get shunted down the lipoxygenase pathway to make leukotrienes. So aspirin... Um, if you're knocking out COX, well, what's, arach what's arachidonic acid as a precursor going to do? It's going to be shunted down the lipoxygenase pathway to make leukotrienes instead. So if they give you a vignette where they say 16-year-old snowboarder uh, had muscle pain and he took uh, aspirin and he got shortness of breath, okay, and, you gotta, and they'll say, what do you avoid in this patient? And the answer is ibuprofen, where acetaminophen's wrong, okay? So acetaminophen's a central acting... Uh, COX inhibitor, but ibuprofen is an NSAID, same as aspirin. Okay, so you avoid those in that patient. We have some patients have greater propensity for that shunting to occur. And then there's overt aspirin allergy, where patient can get nasal polyps, uh, severe asthma. Okay, just know that that constellation is stamped or triad. Increased expiratory phase refers to obstructive lung disease, and by all means, it's not specific for asthma. But it's to my observation and be a me vignettes where they can just say 12 year old boy has unexplained dry cough, as we talked about, and spirometry shows increased expiratory phase. And that's just asthma, okay? It's just very buzzy uh, for uh, obstructive lung disease, but they like it for asthma. Now, very high yield, you know that CO2 is down, holy shit, not up in acute asthma attack. If it's the first time you're hearing this, sounds weird. It's not hard, it's past level, okay? You need to know that your alveolar surface area is not disrupted with asthma the way it is with emphysema. So with asthma, even though your lungs are fucked up, you got bronchoconstriction, CO2 can diffuse quickly, O2 diffuses slowly. So your O2 can't get in because you, you don't want bronchoconstriction in order to get O2 inappropriately. But insofar as you're breathing quickly, CO2 can get out despite the bronchoconstriction. It diffuses more rapidly. So CO2 is down, pH is up, acute respiratory alkalosis, holy shit. Bicarb, no change because it takes the kidneys 12 to 24 hours to change. Now, in COPD, as we talked about, they're chronic CO2 retainers, okay? So an exacerbation of COPD, they can give you a, a guy who has a respiratory rate of 30 and his CO2 is 80, normal range, we says 33 to 44. And you're like, well, how is that possible that his CO2 is so high when he's hyperventilating? It's because despite the hyperventilation, he just literally doesn't have the surface area for gas to get out, for CO2 to get out. So that's why CO2 will be high always in COPD, even with a high respiratory rate. But in conditions like asthma, pulmonary embolism, as long as you're breathing quickly, 
then your CO2 is going to be low. Okay. So obviously caveats associated with that depth of breathing matters. Yes. But we're saying for the overwhelming majority of circumstances, as long as your spiritual rate is elevated, your CO2 is going to be low, not high. Okay. If it's not COPD. Now, initially the low CO2 O2 combo that you have for asthma is called type one respiratory failure. They might say the patient's asthma attack started 30 minutes ago. And now the updated uh, arterial blood gas shows O2 is still low, but your CO2 is now normal and your pH is normal. So you no longer have an acute respiratory alkalosis, but your O2 is still low. And the reason that's occurring is because the patient's getting tired and their respiratory rate's going down. So what's going to happen is the patient needs to be intubated because he or she has an impending type 2 respiratory failure where CO2 will go up and O2 will go down. Okay, so eventually when the patient tires, yes, CO2 will go up, but initially, at the very first, at the onset of the asthma attack, CO2 is low and high. Spirometry makes sense. I did another presentation talking about how uh, all the flow loop curves for uh, obstructive, restrictive, and I have that in my pulmonary PDF, which, which you can check out and learn that stuff in more depth. But you got to know that the curve is uh, scooped out or concave when we have obstructive lung disease. Methicoline is a muscarinic receptor agonist that can reproduce asthma symptoms and spirometry findings. Never give it during an acute attack, obviously, but you can give it outpatient when a patient is uh, between attacks if you suspect asthma. And if it reproduces the symptoms, then that's uh, facilitative in terms of uh, diagnosis. So you got to know outpatient as well as uh, acute asthma attack. So if a patient is having uh, asthma attack, you give beta-2 agonist, okay? So you say, well, here's your beta-2 agonist inhaler. When you get an attack, use it. Now, let's say the patient's getting weekly episodes. U.S. Only is not going to get hysterical about OMG. Is it one episode per week, two episodes per week? Don't worry, okay? They're going to be very clear about it. They're just going to say, patient's already on albuterol, is getting a weekly episode, or is getting two weekly episodes, or gets an episode every other week. Uh, which the following could be added to this patient's regimen to decrease occurrences? And the answer is just fluticasone, okay, and inhaled corticosteroid. Now, if the combination of beta agonist and inhaled corticosteroid is insufficient, patient's still getting uh, recurrent episodes, you can increase the dose of the ICS. If that's still insufficient, you add a long acting beta agonist, okay, some mineral. So those are the four first steps you got to know, okay? Now, let's say after these four first steps, patient's still getting episodes, okay, once a week, twice a week, once every other week, okay, it's still not controlled. We have what's called, number five is a unique one where we call, I just say dot, dot, dot colloquially because number six, let's look at number six first. Number six is oral prednisone. It's last resort because although it's oral prednisone is most effective at decreasing occurrences of asthma, we don't want to use it if at all possible because of Cushing's, right? Cause Cushing syndrome, decreased linear bone growth in kids. So we don't want to use oral prednisone if we can help it. So after the first four, the beta 2 agonist, the ICS, increasing the dose of the ICS, and the LABA, after we go through those first four steps, uh, we have dot, 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 where we can try any number of drugs prior to the oral prednisone. Number five could be Netochromil or chromalin sodium, the mast cell stabilizers, stabilizers. could be xylutan, lipoxidase inhibitor, it could be zephyrolucast, montelukast, okay, leukotriene receptor antagonist. So you could try any number of agents, and then we say, fuck, still not controlled. We could try oral prednisone now uh, indefinitely in this patient, or we could try uh, a 10 day course of oral prednisone, et cetera. But you, an important point you know watching this presentation is you want to try to avoid uh, oral steroids if you can help it in patients, okay? Now, you should just know that inhaled corticosteroids like fluticasone have no role in an acute asthma attack. So we said that the ICS is given outpatient to prevent recurrences. But in an acute asthma attack, let's say 12-year-old in the soccer field, okay, wheezing, you give the beta-2 uh, the beta two agonist, the inhaler, let's say paramedics arrive. They're still going to give beta-2 agonists. They'll give a nebulized, like the face mask with the misting beta-2 agonist and oxygen. And then they're going to give intravenous methylprednisolone, intravenous steroid. So inhaled corticosteroid has no role. It's the intravenous steroid that you give second after the albuterol and the oxygen. Oxygen is always the number one answer 
airway breathing circulation. So choose that. They're not going to force is it oxygen or albuterol. They're not going to do that. But I'm just saying oxygen is always number one if, you're, if, you, if you were to be forced in that position. Okay, so just some weird technical stuff for 2CK level is that if a patient's been hospitalized for any reason for asthma, uh, they mandatory require inhaled corticosteroid, okay? There's a question floating around one of the forms where they say the patient uh, was hospitalized for asthma, uh, and then they were discharged with fluticasone. Uh, they just wanted you to know that you added to their regimen, but they didn't mention albuterol, so it was a bit weird, okay? But I'm just letting you know that if uh, you get a vignette where they say a patient was hospitalized, ICS is automatically part of their regimen, even if they don't mention albuterol. And then same deal. There's another question floating around where they're very audacious. They give you a patient who has moderate asthma. And then they say, which the following should this patient receive? And the correct answer is uh, inhaled fluticasone plus albuterol. It's audacious because they list fluticasone first in the answer choice. Okay. It's like you're giving them together. You're giving albuterol and we'll also start ICS is the second drug, but technically we're co-administering them. We're co, uh, we're discharging the patient. Uh, we're not, not discharging. There's no fucking hospitalization here. But the point is, if a patient has uh, moderate asthma, you can co-start them on albuterol plus fluticasone. But a fucking question, right, says fluticasone plus albuterol. Don't get confused. I've seen students fall into that. Bronchiectasis means dilation of the airways. Okay, ectasia literally means dilation. And they can write the answer choice as loss of musculature of the airways. Then this showing you the CT scan here. Uh, you can see these ectatic, these dilated airways. Okay, the large black uh, circular areas, those dilated airways and CT. And then factoidy is that the most common cause of bronchiectasis worldwide is TB. Most common cause in Western countries is CF. And Yosemite, it's going to be smoking basically always and then just be aware that asthma doesn't go on to cause bronchiectasis even if severe and bronchiectasis is going to present nine out of ten times as cups and cups of foul smelling sputum copious foul smelling sputum in a smoker is bronchiectasis copious foul smelling sputum in tuberculosis or cf is bronchiectasis and then the the term foul smelling means anaerobes such as bacteroides it's not limited to bronchiectasis you get an alcoholic who has foul smelling sputum. It could be aspiration ammonia, it could be pulmonary abscess, uh, but cups and cups of foul smelling sputum, that's bronchiectasis. And I said nine out of 10 times, it's copious foul smelling sputum. One fucking question on one of the PEDS forms where they tell you a kid who's like three has scanty, uh, has scanty white mucus and a dry cough and has a linear opacity visualized in the right middle lobe and the answer is bronchiectasis you're like what the fuck it's called right middle lobe syndrome okay i don't really know what to tell you but it's just one of the weird ways bronchiectasis can present i'm telling you because if you get the question eventually on the nbme then you're going to be like shocked by it but i'm letting you know now that you'll see it clubbing Although it's not limited to bronchiectasis, you could see it with smoking. You could see it with cystic fibrosis, like without bronchiectasis. I mean, it's just, it tends to show up in bronchiectasis vignettes, okay? And you don't see clubbing with asthma as well. Atelectasis, confusing term that just means lung collapse, okay? So I ask students, I'm like, what's atelectasis? They're like, you know what? No fucking idea. It's just lung collapse, all right? It's just, that's what you got to know. And... It's the most common cause of fever within 24 hours of surgery, especially high yield for 2CK. And there's one fucking question with a woman who got a, seat, uh, a Caesar uh, two days ago and she has a fever. So it's most common cause in the first 24 hours following surgery. One fucking question where it was two days after, okay? But it should be high yield on your differentials. So before you jump to sepsis, UTI, thrombophlebitis, drug allergy, deep abscess, all these potential causes of post-op fever for 2CK step three, atelectasis, baseline pass level right after surgery. And a lot of this is due to pain meds, patients not mobilizing, ambulating the way they need to. They could be on oxycodone, oxycodone plus, which is an opioid, oxycodone plus acetaminophen, it's a high yield combo post-surgery, can just slow their respiratory rate. Okay, patients not taking deep breaths, so it can increase the risk for atelectasis. And they can tell you the chest x-ray shows bi-basal opacities or shadows. It's just one of the ways they can describe it.
I've seen across vignettes. And atelectasis can also be caused by tumors and pneumonia. Okay, so it can lead to obstruction distal to the tumor or pneumonia. They can call that a obstructive or resorptive atelectasis. Shows up on one of the step one NBMEs. Now you say obstructive sleep apnea. That's a random fucking segue. Don't know what to tell you. Actually, there was no segue. It's just jumped straight to OSA. Okay, so similar to COPD, these are chronic CO2 retainers. So high CO2, bicarb goes up to compensate, and pH can be normal or low depending on how compensated it is. And the high yield point I want you to know is that obstructive sleep apnea can cause core pulmonale. So they can say obese dude wakes up on poly, he has polysomnography showing he wakes up 15 times in the middle of the night, 70 times in the middle of the night, and he's got uh, right axis deviation on ECG, which means right ventricular hypertrophy, or he's got JVD, or he's got peripheral edema. So he's got evidence of right heart failure. And that's just, well, that's corporal minel due to OSA. So hypoxic vasoconstriction. Hypoxic vasoconstriction leading to pulmonary hypertension, increased afterload in the right ventricle. Okay, and I've talked about in my other presentations, right bundle branch block, right axis deviation, wide splitting of S2, all mean right ventricular hypertrophy. It's different from loud P2. I, I don't mean to get complicated here, but you need to know loud P2 and tricuspid regurg simply mean pulmonary hypertension. They don't mean right ventricular hypertrophy. But if they say wide splitting of S2, that means right ventricular hypertrophy. You've got right heart changes at that point. It's when you have right heart changes due to a pulmonary cause that we now call that right heart structural changes, okay? Ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, that we now call that core pulmonale. If you're confused by that, uh, you can go to my cardio PDF where I talk about core pulmonale, left heart failure, right heart failure, uh, very nice stuff there. So you need to know it can cause depression as well, obstructive sleep apnea, it's just mood disorder due to a medical condition. Same thing for thyroid, hypothyroidism, just mood disorder due to medical condition. I already mentioned polysomnography, they want diagnosed. Now let's just randomly jump to fucking anaphylaxis. How's that sound? Okay, why not? So anaphylaxis, type 1 hypersensitivity, where you got an antigen such as pollen, uh, you know, or bee sting or peanut, and it's going to be it's going to bind the fab fragments of IgE on the surface of mast cells, basophils. They juxtapose, come in a close proximity, a cross-linked mast cells, basophils degranulate, release histamine. Okay, histamine can be the answer. They'll give you a 12-line paragraph of anaphylaxis. They say which of the following is responsible for this patient's condition? The answer is histamine, past level. Or they say, how do you treat it? Answer is epinephrine, where histamine is also listed, but it's wrong. So you have to be careful. You treat with IM epinephrine, okay? But histamine, prostaglandin are released by the mast cells, basophils, and then eosinophils can be recruited as a result of histamine and prostaglandin. Now, I just mentioned it could be dyspnea, it could be swelling, it could be low blood pressure. And they want decreased vascular resistance, increased cardiac output, Normal or no or normal or decrease for pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. I talk about all this stuff in my high yield arrows PDF, okay, in the path PDF, cardio PDF. But you're gonna have decreased vascular resistance and anaphylaxis, and cardiac output's high. Okay, so some students get hysterical about is cardiac output low sometimes? It's not. Okay, for your simile, they want high cardiac output for anaphylaxis. It's a type of distributive shock. As I said, I am epinephrine is uh, what we do to treat and beta-2 agonism is going to open the airways alpha-1 agonism is going to constrict arterials and restore blood pressure there's a question with the two ck forms where they want you to know that in addition to im Epi and they say in the question in addition to an epipen which the following can decrease occurrences in this patient the answer is venom immunotherapy i've had students ask well is that only with let's say a bee sting as the etiology like what if it's peanut allergy or something great fucking question Okay, I'm fairly sure that this phrasing, this venom immunotherapy, is just very generic for any antigen that you administer to desensitize. U.S. simile is not going to obsess over it. Don't don't worry. It's one fucking question. Okay, if they just say, you know, watching this clip, you say, well, I know I am epinephrine, epipen is what we do for treatment. I've heard of that, but venom immunotherapy, what's that? If they take it a step further, that's the answer they want. Okay. Scombroid. Now, students get very uh, fanatical about weird diagnoses. You need to know that meaty fish, mahi-mahi, mackerel, you can have bacteria within the fish 
that produce histidine decarboxylase, which can convert histidine, an amino acid in the fish, into histamine, causing an asthma-like presentation. Okay, so it's often confused as allergy to fish. Now, let's say you're 32 years old, you've eaten fish various points in your life, you've never had an allergy to it, and then all of a sudden at 32, you go to Bali and you eat mahi mahi and you get what if what is a, an asthma like presentation. Okay, that's not allergy, that's scombroid. Okay, got to be aware of it. Now, the caveat is don't get trigger happy when you learn weird sounding diagnoses because scombroid is only meaty fish. It's not shellfish. So if they tell you like patient was eating shellfish, gets an asthma like presentation, and you see that alphabetically, you see choice D, scombroid, choice E, shellfish allergy, and you're like, OMG, scombroid, like I learned this cool sounding diagnosis, but it's fucking wrong, okay, if they say shellfish. So uh, I'm telling you, this shows up in the US so shellfish allergy is separate from scombroid. Okay, that's it for this presentation. Uh, you know, somewhat disjointed uh, amalgamation of conditions here, but I'm obviously going to make more uh, content, so subscribe to my channels and appreciate your time. That's it.